Hello, everyone. It's a pleasure to have you here, and I'm very grateful for our colleagues that made it and for all of you that are taking some time uh, to spend with us and discuss um, the issues around stories uh, of uh, spatial violence in Asian cities. So I'm Catalina Ortiz. Um, I'm an associate professor at the Development Planning Unit, and today is my pleasure to uh, present the results uh, of the project, Yangon Stories, um, and at the same time, discuss these findings uh, of the project in the context and in dialogue with similar initiatives from which we got inspired as well. So today's event has two main aims. One is to present the findings uh, of the project, uh, but also discuss how similar initiatives have been uh, addressing issues of documenting evictions, human rights violations, and other territorial erasures. And to discuss the theoretical underpinnings and the methodological approaches around displaceability and spatial violence that are emerging in the region. Today, we're very fortunate to have here with us um, Professor um, Hyun Bangshin, from the Department of Geography and Environment uh, from LSE and the director of the So Sui Hok uh, Southeast Asia Center, as well as Professor um, um, Ratula Kundu from the Center for Urban Policy and Governance from the Tata Institute of Social Science, Ruchika Lal, researcher at the Indian Institute of Human Settlements and part of the Missing Basti Collective, and um, Easy Rhodes from Lund University and Shoko Sakuma from UCL. So today we are going to be uh, presenting uh, three projects um, that are um, dealing with issues around spatial violence. We're going to start with the Yangon Stories project, then we're going to move to the Make Break project in Mumbai, uh, and we're going to be closing with the Missing uh, Basti project in Delhi, followed by some input and discussion from Professor Hyun, and we're going to have uh, some time for questions uh, and answers uh, from the audience. So without further ado, I'm just going to uh, move then um, to present to you the Yangon Stories project. So if we can move to the following one. So as we know, violence shapes cities, but when focusing on Yangon, it's clear that we are witnessing an extreme case. Since the colonial period, the spatial violence has been a regular occurrence for people throughout the city. Violent spatial regimes led back by successive state powers have only increased. And in 2021, the scale of these multiple violences are unprecedented and countrywide, displaying raw brutality exerted by the junta. Yangon Stories started as a collaborative and participatory project to trace the living heritage of community-led housing processes as leverage tool to counteract the spatial violence of evictions. But then it turned into a depth and complex research process aimed at documenting and bearing witness of the spatial violence in the city. The project attempts to mobilize action against further spatial violence and to provide a basis of inquiry to the extent of which spatial violence impacts urban development and everyday life. But we had to grapple with the ethical impossibilities of working in very dire conditions that depict the complex timescapes of violence and loss, while asking ourselves what Catherine McKiernick um, asks how might one foster a commitment to acknowledging violence and undoing its persistent frame rather than simply analytically reprising violence? This project is the product of a collective work of a team whose members cannot even be named due to security constraints. What we present here is thanks to all of them with deep gratitude and standing in solidarity with our colleagues and friends in and from Burma. So, to give you just a glimpse of the current conditions of the chaos brought by the coup last February is still here and present.
Shoko, can we move to the following one, please? Shoko, can we move to the following slide? So today we're going to be presenting briefly just part of the headlines uh, of what we've been doing and covering in this project. So we're going to discuss briefly the framings about the spatial violence, its modalities, continuities, and the responses and impact that has had, as well as presenting the online platform that has been one of the main outputs uh, of the project. So if we go to the following. We wanted to locate um, the project, uh, drawing from the very rich Burma studies strand, and also uh, addressing a transdisciplinary approach to the nexus between urban space and violence. Uh, and the inspiration conceptually and theoretical of our project is coming from this uh, very concept of a spatial violence uh, that was proposed by Hershey and Sadiqi uh, in 2014, and building from the current debates around this nexus. Um, Hersher and Sadiq uh, state that the spatial violence is constitutive of architecture, urbanism, and their epistemologicals, and therefore is more a method than a topic that is offering us a spatial history of political violence as a distinct form of other histories of political violence. So we are locating the contribution of our project within the different strands that are being exploring and giving us insights in terms of how to address and understand uh, issues about the spatial violence. And here, many of my colleagues um, have been doing very interesting work in depicting this kind of what we mapped as these five strands that are discussed in this nexus. One, in terms of the violent production of neoliberal spaces and all the discussions around this possession. The other that is uh, connected to ideas of violence, of unharming and displaceability, or the discussions around violence and conflict in urban spaces. And recently, a very uh, interesting and very um, abundant discussion in terms of slow violence, infrastructural violence, and urban trauma. And it's within this context that we are connecting with the ideas about the spatial violence and how to historicize architecture and urbanism. So it's within this context that we've been thinking and trying to understand what are the features or the connections in terms of urban violence and scale, urban violence and temp temporality, urban violence um, and causality, and how urban violence uh, and space operate. So this literature brings a very important and interesting analytical purchase, but somehow fails to explain the longer term trajectories of these possessions linked to post-colonial and military projects and its concomitant modalities of spatial violence that go beyond evictions. So is with that in mind, can we go to the next? That we proposed uh, the idea of uh, understanding a spatial violence in terms of an accelerating process that we, as we are witnessing in the case uh, of Yangon. And the main argument we are making is that urban spatial violence is a wider analytical category than is usually described, and that operates cyclically as a territorial palimpsest of diverse modalities of a slow, a structural, and punitive violence. In doing so then, spatial violence requires legal and extralegal tools as well as military urban tactics resulting in multiple geotraumas and in the continuous intent of erasure of particular populations from space, from archives and from memories. So is this the key um, idea that is underpinning our project? And in order to uh, address uh, and tackle this idea, um, the following uh, slide is gonna show us how we've been, uh, been able to actually trace um, and try to answer the question, what are the modalities then and the continuities uh, of a spatial violence from, from post-colonial times to the military coup? And what we were able to address and to reconfigure uh, in, the, in the face of, of the coup uh, and in the face of the pandemic uh, that 
completely change our assumptions, our questions, and basically the general conditions that we could uh, make and conduct the research on. So what we had to do was trying to center an ethics of care for the team, introduce a pause, and reconsider what can be done. So we change our guiding um, um, research question, uh, as well as the whole methodological approach uh, in a context with no access to any formal archives or to any alternative sources, with high personal risk and with data loss. What we uh, ended up doing is focusing on this uh, and what we call unintended archives, trying to tackle and trying to address different uh, sources that we never ambition uh, addressing. Going uh, deeper in the use of digital ethnography to actually focus in particular um, sites where there has been configured or understood as some strongholds of resistance, as well as using life stories, trying to do an amalgamation of interviews and historical data and using cartoons uh, as a vehicle to explain to a broader audience uh, what is happening in terms of uh, these stories of spatial violence. And most importantly, the work around counter mapping when doing a collaborative uh, strategy of assembling spatial data sets to trace erasure, punishment, and loss. And I think it's in this context that we took very seriously the ethical concerns trying to work, of course, only with verified sources, preserving anonymity of all the people that has been engaging with us, providing a historical context uh, of all the um, facts and um, um, data points, if you will, in our work, and using encrypted channels um, to protect also the integrity of our members in order to use and make a contribution to the researchers and the advocates that are working around these issues. So Isi is gonna be presenting then the following part in terms of what are the part of our key findings. Isi. Thanks, Kata. Um, Shoko, I think you can go to the next slide, yeah. So in this project, we focused on two kind of main um, things. We focused on modalities of spatial violence and on the continuities of spatial violence. So in terms of modalities, we looked at slum clearance policies, arson, fire, nationalization, and punitive or territorial control as four kind of main modalities of spatial violence. Um, but we also looked at the temporal, processual, and patterned continuities of spatial violence. And I'll talk a little bit about each of these in the, in the following. Um, but before I start, I wanted to just highlight that one of the things we've been talking about a lot recently is, is how Myanmar's legal frameworks that allow for confiscation, allow for nationalization, and allow for eviction, not only facilitate everyday forms of spatial violence, but they also create space and context for catalytic out outbursts of extreme forms of spatial and other forms of violence as we're seeing now with the coup and as we saw as well in 2017 with the Rohingya. You can go to the next slide, Shoko. Um, and so to understand this sort of temporal dynamic, this, this is from our website. Um, so you don't need to read that. It's just an example of our timeline. But um, to understand this kind of temporal dynamic in spatial violence, and in particular, the cyclical elements that we've been seeing in Yangon, we took a long view to this project beginning from uh, 1852 onwards. And we kind of looked at spatial violence across a long historical um, time period. And the patterns that we've noticed are multiple, but one of the ones I want to highlight is that the large scale evictions and re rewriting of property relations tended to follow conquest, coups, and periods of military government in Myanmar. And without a long-term plan or investment in housing, this particular form of spatial violence that we've been seeing, this wholesale removal of communities and resettlement elsewhere, it's a cyclical pattern, right? It, it, it's recurring every 30 years or so, or whenever the population of so-called squatters has reached a certain threshold. And while evictions with and without due process have occurred throughout Myanmar's post-independence history under all governments, the mass relocations we've only uh, seen during not only periods of military rule, but periods of transition to military rule. So in the early days of military rule. 
And you can interpret this multiple ways and other scholars have looked at this as well. Um, is this a decisive show of force, you know, um, a form of legitimation an undertaking of a major new project, or is this a punitive measure against those that may be seen as, as troublemakers or uh, going against the military rule? You can go to the next slide, Shoko. Um, so in, I just wanna give one example today of one of the periods that we looked at in depth. We looked at the sort of uh, post-independence and post-Second World War period in Myanmar, um, because in 1958, there was a military caretaker government that was formed under General Ne Win and that, and that ran the country for two years and administered the 1960 national elections. And this is a lot of, uh, uh, it's, it's really important to look at this in the context of today as well, and to look at today in the context of the 19, late 1950s and early 1960s, because Min Aung Lang, the current coup leader in Myanmar, sees his role as quite similar to today. He sees himself as a caretaker. Um, and, or at least that's how he publicly has talked about himself. So one of the major legacies of this caretaker government was the removal of 60,000 households or 300,000 people living in so-called illegally built huts in downtown Yangon and their resettlement in satellite towns. Um, but given that this is a post-war context, a post-Second World War, um, and that there was an extreme housing shortage during this period of urban population growth, um, in the early independence period and due to the severe destruction caused by the war in the bottom right uh, corner, you can see a photo of downtown Yangon. Um, and this is a, a, a few years after the war in the early 1950s, you can see that there was mass uh, demolition of buildings that were, had been bombed, right? And so people in the, in the vacant lots um, built uh, makeshift houses. Um, so these were built informally, but not necessarily illegally. These earmarked satellite towns that were earmarked for relocation uh, were farmland or sometimes industrial land and had limited transport connections to downtown Rangoon. So, and, and the other thing to note then is that not all of the hut, hut dwellers that were evicted and relocated were new arrivals. Many of these people were from downtown Rangoon and had lost their homes in the war and had rebuilt on their same sites and their removal to outer areas severed social, religious and economic ties. But one of the things we tried to do in this project that we wanted to do from the beginning, but as, as Kata said earlier, we had to do a lot of changing um, in our methodology due to COVID and the coup. We really wanted to look at not only eviction sites, but understand these relocation trajectories as well. So what happened in relocation sites? Like where did people go? How did communities rebuild? This is one of the key things we wanted to document. Um, and so for as many sites as possible, we can see this later on the website, but we tried to note also not only where evictions occurred, um, which on, on the right side of this uh, slide, you can see a 1991 map from UN Habitat that's marking the eviction sites in the early 1990s, late 1980s. Um, but we also wanted to know where people moved to and how how different communities were resettled and their stories in this. And Shoko will speak a bit more about this later on in terms of the stories. And you know, it wasn't always possible to map where people went, but this is something that we really um, were interested in from the, from the get-go. Um, the second form of, the second modality, I guess we could say is, is nationalization. Um, and this is a photo from 1964, but nationalization in Burma in the 1960s led to wide scale dispossession of minority communities, particularly Burmese families of South Asian or Chinese descent who were involved in trade and business and may have had their homes and businesses in the same building. So when their business was nationalized, their home was nationalized as well. This led to waves of emigration that lasted until the late 1980s with as many as 300,000 people emigrating from Myanmar and heading to India, particularly in the 1960s, but also in the decades that followed. Um, and the nationalization was ostensibly meant to target black marketeers, but its unstated purpose was to demolish the largely Chinese and Indian merchant class. You can go to the next slide, Shoko. And we see similar actions today. Um, the, the junta is currently using nationalizations, though not yet at the same scale as the 1960s, so I don't want to make that an equivalency here. Um, but they are using nationalizations to target properties of activists, NLD members, and elected officials, and those suspected of being members of people's defense forces across the country. Houses are seized and sealed, and any residents are evicted. This action is punitive, and it punishes the entire family rather than an individual, but it also attempts to cut resistance ties to space and kinship networks. I'm showing ISP's work here rather than our map, um, because Shoko will show our website a bit later, but I wanted to highlight as well in this uh, 
chance here to talk to you all about the adjacent work going on within and outside Myanmar um, on mapping these forms of spatial violence. Um, the third modality is, is fire or arson. Um, we lost, we went to Google. Somebody's in, we're in Google. Shoko, are, are you there? <laughs> okay. So the third is, uh, <laughs> um, we're in Google, but anyhow, the third modality is fire. Um, it's a, it's a destructive quality, right? It extends to property relations and not only the kind of pieces of paper that represent relationships between people and space and other people, which can be lost in fire, like deeds or sales contracts. Um, but in many cases, the act of fire results in the legal severance of these property relationships in Myanmar. Um, okay, sorry. <laughs> sorry about us, bear with us there. Um, <laughs> So, it, it, and, and what I mean by this is, is one of the findings so far in this research is just how many different pieces of legislation involve fire and the role that fire can play in nationalizing land and property. Um, and, and one of the other things I found quite interesting is this legislation spans the historical range from the late 1800s to the contemporary period. So there's not only existing legislation, but there's continued additions to legislation that uh, involve the use of fire um, and involve uh, what happens to property after fire. So one of the laws is, um, is a law that, you can go back to fire still, Shoko, a law that allows for nationalization of land and property in the event of arson by the owner during times of relative peace. Um, and this is used like fairly commonly if there's a suspected arson, there's an investigation, the, the area is shut down, et cetera, and often uh, nationalized and confiscated by the state. Um, however, this allows the state or currently the military to enact horrendous acts of arson and then turn around and claim that communities have arsoned their own homes. This then allows them to cordon off burn sites, confiscate land and prohibit any sort of rebuilding or um, uh, resettlement there. And we've seen this before with the Rohingya in 2017. This isn't, uh, this isn't necessarily new on this large scale in Myanmar, but since the coup, we've seen fire used as a punitive and warning tactic serving to demolish everything, right? Houses, crops, property relations, culture, dignity, heritage, um, while also serving to warn other communities of what might happen to them if they don't get in line. And we see fire in the aftermath of fire as forms of spatial violence similar to acts of nationalization or forced evictions, with the idea being to eliminate ties between those households and their space and communities. We can, yeah. Uh, and lastly, punitive and territorial control is, is our last kind of modality. Um, this is a map of the martial law areas in Yangon that were declared in spring of 2021. And it, um, for those familiar with Yangon, you'll, you'll notice, and you of course know this, that the martial law locations are all previous relocation sites, resettlement sites, where those previous, previously subjected to forced evictions in the 1950s and 1990s were moved to. Um, these areas in kind of, uh, common parlance now are seen as troublesome or wild areas often they're depicted as this, um, but these are also working class neighborhoods urban poor communities and industrial communities. Um, from early on in the coup it seemed that this territorial control via martial law was being used as a punitive tool, much like other forms of spatial violence enacted historically and since the coup. In the second year of the coup. Now, um, many of the conditions of martial law that first targeted these areas of Yangon have been applied blanket, blanketly across the entire country with military checkpoints, checking citizenship cards, checking COVID-19 vaccination certificates, and often requiring letters of recommendation from military appointed administrators to come into town to move across a junction um, to get to the hospital, right? All sorts of uh, movement restrictions. And in Myanmar, the last kind of movement restriction I want to note um, is about the household registration and guest registration. To be considered a legal resident, you need to have a household registration. This is also known as a household list or a midnight list, as it was dubbed after the nighttime checks on residences during previous periods of military rule. If your name is not on this household list, but you're a resident in the household, then you need to obtain a guest registration. This element of household kind of household level control was abolished in 2016, but brought back in after the coup. So we've now had about uh, a little over a year now of this new guest registration or kind of reinstituted guest registration. The problem is you can only get a household list in a place where you're a permanent resident. This means that you own property there or where you're registered as a statutory tenant, not a yearly kind or monthly tenant. So young households, migrants, and particularly minority households, they face multiple challenges in obtaining the household list. 
This means that they're often de facto registered as guests in their own home. So the use of, sorry about that, the use of um, martial law, military checkpoints, guest registration, and this mandatory ID cards and travel is both punitive and a form of territorial control, a forced immobility that in turn creates new and exacerbated forms of mobility. And I have one last slide I wanted to just pull up so people understand this kind of larger national context. This is the most recent UNHCR um, estimates of displacement. Again, these are estimates. So I think that it's safe to say it's probably much higher numbers, but we don't know that. We can't really, we can't really comment on that. Um, but the restrictions on travel have immobilized people, keeping them in place so they don't have to contend with military checkpoints, doc, you know, having documentation and having vaccination cards. But it's also led to forms of forced and illicit mobility. Um, with legal avenues of migration lar largely curtailed, Myanmar people are paying thousands of dollars to brokers to move them across Myanmar and then also in other cases across international borders. People are forging COVID-19 vaccination certificates as these have become key documents enabling mobility. And there are now 700,000 newly displaced people, newly internally displaced people with documented 40,000 people having fled to neighboring countries. And if you see in the map, it says that you know 500 have fled across the border to Thailand. That's definitely not accurate, right? So um, we, can, we, can, we can assume that the numbers are far higher. I think you can go to the next one, Shoko, if you're, yeah, okay. Um, I'm sorry, I think uh, I just said some connection or something. Um, can you see my the screen? Uh, uh, Katrin is sharing, thank you so much. Um, so in terms of the uh, impact, the uh, tactic to over the, uh, you can go to the next slide maybe. Um, uh, so tactics of uh, spatial violence creates condition of displaceability rather than just a temporary event of displacement. It erases particular populations from space memories and destroys their relations to the society. Spatial violence exists in the system, translated into multiple difficulties on the ground. As a response, many people just uh, need to uh, deal with each challenge individually, often tied with uh, monetary exchanges which create constant tensions. There are some organized responses such as collective housing in non-confrontational manner to practically survive in the different political systems. In the case of railway workers eviction last year due to the participation in CDM, CDM uh, their response was to follow their eviction order uh, in order to uh, continue protesting to the junta. Next slide, please. Um, to visualize diverse impact and responses, we developed the cartoon stories. This was primarily triggered by seeing mixed public reactions when massive evictions started taking place in Yangon. Some, some people commented negatively, such as at least the military did a good thing by clearing the squatters. We thought it is important to share uh, what brought them into squatter reality uh, so that they cannot simply blame as illegal. This led us to develop four stories under the uh, first chapter, uh, uh, why do people live in informal settlements? Now, it was also to create sympathy and understanding for their struggles as they were in the dire situation in need for support after losing job, home, social network, which are especially covered in the second round chapter, uh, the various impacts of evictions. Uh, lastly, uh, we also wanted to highlight their important role in resistance, as well as mobilizing the community. Uh, we particularly covered in the third chapter, uh, squatter struggles in, and resistance since the coup. Uh, go to the next one, sorry. Um, we collaborated uh, with uh, different uh, artists uh, from and within and outside of Myanmar, uh, who translated the stories into the very powerful graphics. Uh, this was uh, uh, also to disseminate their talents as well as uh, to support them uh, during this, this difficult time. Go to the next slide. Um, this is an example of the hostel dwellers' stories. Uh, while many hostels operate informally without uh, completing with the space, uh, uh, like all the like any infrastructure infrastructure or space requirements. Hostel is a practical, flexible option for those who are lacking in documentations, which are often the case with the migrant workers. Uh, the, the story shows uh, how the life in hostel makes uh, them more invisible, 
for example, during the COVID time, uh, they did not get any support from the uh, outside. And also uh, another eviction uh, uh, was uh, putting them into the more uh, dire situation. Could you go to the next slide? Another story is showing the blurry boundary between informal and formal and the family member who needs to run away because of his participation in the protest and the individual survival by relying on the family network and the money. The hardships uh, uh, from the coup have intensified uh, such movements and the people's insecurity. Uh, uh, the full stories are available on, online on our website. Um, thank you. Uh, lastly, uh, I'd like to go to the website. Uh, maybe, um, sorry, I'll just do some other. Um, this uh, platform is uh, uh, is uh, aimed to document the modality and trajectories of uh, special violence, and uh, also attempt to mobilize uh, uh, social actions, uh, particularly by uh, supporting the researcher practitioners, as well as to reach out to the general public. Uh, we are also planning to make it available on uh, Boomies and plus uh, more visible on the smartphones. On this uh, top page, uh, we have some uh, future uh, stories uh, showing the uh, chronological trajectories of eviction, post evictions event with the map and along with the map and photos and political events uh, since the colonial period. Sorry, I will just go uh, very quickly, but uh, please explore later. Um, and then uh, under this about page, uh, we have the, the brief outline of this uh, platform, as well as uh, some notion of the spatial violence uh, in, especially in Myanmar, example is in Myanmar. Um, in timeline, uh, easy shared some snapshot, uh, but uh, this is a chronological uh, 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 political situation and the, the uh, uh, modality of spatial violence uh, each period, by each period, uh, key regulations, policies on the left side. And uh, there are some uh, details. Uh, if you click more, you can go to the uh, a bit more detail about uh, how the space and uh, what who was uh, uh, affected by those violence and rationals, uh, common rationals, and legal frameworks, uh, etc. Um, then uh, going back to the this uh, map interactive interactive map uh, shows uh, forced evictions uh, from the uh, since the colonial period, uh, then uh, by the some. Uh, uh, to trace that uh, the patterns, uh, as well as the uh, fire and the nationalization. But this, uh, in terms of fire and nationalization, we uh, we shifted the methodology uh, as Katarina mentioned. Uh, uh, but uh, we uh, mapped it by the uh, after the coup, uh, 2021, in the union level, but by the township, uh, we didn't really do the, the, by the each uh, event because of the security reasons. Um, and in terms of the post-coup uh, resistance, uh, violence and the resistance, uh, we put it under the uh, five different categories and the tracing the, between, the, uh, between February and uh, October last year. Uh, and uh, this, uh, sorry, going back to the uh, map section, if you click that each event, it will show the, uh, a bit detail under the, uh, uh, on the bar, uh, on the bottom. Uh, and uh, this uh, resource section, uh, this shows kind of a, repos a repository of uh, the uh, relevant materials, uh, such as uh, uh, news articles, academic articles, books, uh, some regulations. Uh, then the, in terms of the uh, stories, uh, this uh, shows uh, memories and experiences of the people affected by the special violence. Uh, the future stories go to the, uh, it's similar to the, the cover page. Um, the, the cartoon stories uh, is uh, something I explained I just a bit before uh, by, uh, we, if you click each one, it goes to the each stories. 
and the interviews uh, uh, interview script uh, from the uh, uh, of the people who are impacted by the uh, violence and resistance in Nantaya, the suburb area in uh, uh, Yango after the coup. And um, these uh, video clips uh, are showing the two key events, featuring the two key events of uh, which happened uh, took place last year. The, uh, the impact of the martial law and then the massive crackdown and the forced evictions. And um, we are also uh, trying to put uh, more uh, non-traditional materials like such as the poems and the photos on this uh, under this story section. And the contact is like to open and uh, so it's, uh, we are also uh, trying to make it more open and collaborative. And uh, finally, we put some uh, special section after, uh, about the post coup material. Uh, mostly we covered uh, under the map and the stories, but also uh, here we added a uh, timeline I have to, which have the detailed account of the detailed documentation of uh, uh, what happened in terms of the violence and the resistance in that uh, the township is uh, called Line Tire uh, between the February and um, October. Uh, we also have some uh, definition of the each e e events in the uh, from the perspective of this uh, post coup violence and the resistance. Um, I think that's all for now. Uh, uh, but uh, we uh, would like to hear uh, feedback or comments. So please feel free to explore. If there's any question, uh, would like to uh, happy to hear. More. Well, thank you, Shoko, for uh, Anisi for uh, walking us through some of the key features of what we've been uh, working around. So now I would like to invite Ratula Kundu to show us a little bit uh, uh, about the Make Break project. Ratula. Thank you so much. And uh, thank you to the team that went before me for that excellent and rich presentation of your work. Congratulations. Um, you know, the scale is kind of mind boggling in terms of what you've been able to do in the past one year amidst, uh, of course, such difficulties. Um, so I'm Dr. Kundu and I'm at the Center for Urban Policy and Governance. And I'm going to walk you through uh, uh, the Make Break, uh, which is an online exhibition that uh, we've created uh, as part of a, a collaborative project that we undertook at the Center for Urban Policy and Governance at TIS. Um, in the year 2013 and 2016 is when we did the project, but um, the online exhibition came about more, um, you know, uh, was brought together uh, in the year of the pandemic rather, because we initially thought of thought about making it into a physical uh, exhibition, but uh, the pandemic forced us into reconsidering the mode and what we have in front of you is are really glim glimpses from um, the, the make break um, uh, story. Uh, so I'm just going to put it in. Yeah. So um, the, you know, what is make break? Um, it is, um, it's the result of a collaborative project, like I said, uh, which was between uh, three cities, Rio, Durban, and Mumbai. Um, and it was an attempt by uh, three academic partners, this being one of them, to really sort of grapple with the question around, uh, you know, how does one explain the kind of uh, embedded violence uh, as well as progressive change in the making of Southern cities um, and the making in, in a particular trajectory that, uh, make cities into world-class cities. And it's often that the, that the underlying uh, sort of uh, violence, which comes about through displacement uh, as one of the major sort of tangible, um, clear sort of visible elements of it, uh, it's not often that is registered as a violence. So I think embedding our project was the understanding of structural violence of which I think uh, the state and the market um, you know, play a very, very important role. And for us, I think uh, the word make break uh, sort of captured uh, for us at the Mumbai team level, 
um, after we did the research around the three cities uh, at the Mumbai level, we wanted to sort of come up with, uh, you know, something uh, which would show um, how have we sort of conceived of this uh, research question, what kind of answers have we got to the research question, uh, how do we sort of depict the kind of quiet violence in the remaking of Mumbai into a world-class city. Uh, for us, the timeline has been the last 20 decades, uh, following India's sort of uh, 1991, sort of the, that's the break point where you have liberalization, privatization, and globalization taking place across India. And that's where a lot of the focus uh, shifts into the cities, particularly metropolitan areas, which are being then restructured um, and sort of uh, remade into global cities. So one of the ideas behind uh, you know, the word make break was to also capture how, uh, you know, how simultaneous these processes are of both making uh, and breaking and who are the people who are involved therefore in the making and the breaking of cities. Um, and this we wanted to capture in the period uh, post 91 with respect to Mumbai. Uh, what we've done is we've uh, told the story of Mumbai, but we've taken a very conscious effort to look at it through four different stories uh, of four different neighborhoods, uh, which uh, look at four very different geographies and histories, uh, as well as therefore trajectories of uh, making and breaking and then remaking of cities. Um, I think it was a conscious effort to bring out the kind of distinct as well as diverse histories and trajectories of, uh, you know, the different kind of responses also that you have and reactions that you have to the effort of making Mumbai into a global city. And I think um, uh, at the back of my, my uh, back of our mind as a team, we were sort of looking at how to deal with the question of, you know, whether neoliberalism stands for a, a, you know, um, a sort of term, term that captures everything in one go, like one particular term that, and which sort of, uh, you know, gives us a fair picture, a fair depiction of what's happening on the ground. And this is, I think, what, you know, made us uncomfortable. And I think the idea of doing four stories and four neighborhoods was to grapple with the distinctions of the trajectories in each case and the way in which resistance has been or the protest or the remaking has the story of remaking etc has been uh, carved uh, through people's movements through people's uh, uh, different kinds of trajectories. Uh, so what does uh, make break uh, seek to uncover through this digital uh, exhibition? One way was of course you know to uh, reach out to a wider audience with our research findings which ultimately stay behind, you know, the academic papers that we do. So we figured out this was a way to sort of uh, converse, uh, to have a dialogue uh, with wider publics. Uh, and it sought to uncover, of course, the kind, uh, to reveal the kind of attempts at restructuring Mumbai into a world-class city, the attempts that have been made by the state and the market. Uh, why I'm saying reveal is because we feel that structural violence operates in very invisible ways, in ways that often, you know, there is uh, the elite and the middle class are even complicit in the ways they understand the transformations to be taking place. They're okay with it. There's a certain kind of normalcy to the way, in the way the city seems to be transforming, the big kind of towers that are coming up, the kind of projects, infrastructural projects that you see. And it's often that people say, well, you know, this, this is development, this is progress. We wanted to sort of step back and, uh, you know, question this, right? Uh, who is this good for? Who is being impacted and how? And I think these stories tell us uh, very different, capture very, very different moments, very, very different ways of, uh, you know, how people have been affected and what they're doing about it. Um, it also, like I think in the last presentation where you saw, you know, there was, there was a kind of a historical trajectory for us, as well as a simultaneous um, sort of way in which violence was operating. And for us too, I think it has been a cyclical process of making an unbreaking, which has been uh, uncovered, uh, where we've looked at the making and breaking of homes, of habitats, infrastructures, communities, and livelihoods. Um, and I think, um, and I think, 
at every point, we've tried to question the quietness or the invisibility of that process of transformation. Um, and really asking who is bringing about the transformation, how are they bringing it about, and what kinds of processes do you see on the ground? It also was an attempt to bring people to the foreground, especially poor, poorer communities, urban working class communities, who have struggled uh, against all odds to make settlements, to make homes, to make livelihoods, uh, to make a claim to the city and who are actually disproportionately affected by these processes of restructuring. And uh, I think it also underscores the agency of people in making their homes, in making the city, in building their livelihoods, in rebuilding their livelihoods, in nurturing uh, their life worlds and their fierce struggles in resisting processes of uh, erasure, processes of marginalization, of stereotyping, and of course, they're creative and often democratic ways of remaking the city, which the stories of, you know, the planning documents don't show us, uh, often erase uh, quite deliberately. Um, so the way in which we went about making the exhibition uh, was, you know, using, we'd initially done as part of the research process, produced a city profile, um, which is called the city produced, which is a history of uh, mapping the different ways Mumbai has uh, uh, changed uh, through these different decades. And uh, once we got a better grip of the story at the city level, we were be able to sort of go in depth uh, much more into the ground level where we took up the four cases. And the four cases where they reflect very different geographies, both from the core of the city as well as the periphery of the city, uh, they uh, depict a very uh, well-settled historical communities, as well as those uh, newer communities on the periphery that are still sort of struggling to uh, make a claim to that particular space. Um, and uh, one of the things that we've done is these in-depth sort of case studies, the four case studies, um, have, been, uh, have been brought about through mixed method research. We've done a lot of participatory mapping. Uh, we've done interviews, uh, life histories, spent time in the communities. We've also had barefoot volunteers working with us uh, in our sort of mixed teams. Um, once we've sort of done that uh, in the period of uh, actually putting together the exhibition, uh, we also fell back on a lot of archival materials, documents, et cetera, um, uh, data, and we started putting them together for each of those four uh, sort of case studies that we looked at and layering them, of course, into the website. And that was done by, you know, a, a, a whole bunch of different people in the team that I cannot name again, uh, who brought together their different skills in, in bringing together, in, uh, you know, in giving voice to these stories and making them alive. So just briefly, uh, if you look at the four stories, um, uh, they're Kamatipura, JVLR, Nalasapara, and uh, MWOD, uh, which as you can see from the map, they represent very different geographies uh, as well as uh, unique trajectories. Uh, they also sort of demonstrate, uh, like I said, the different ways in which structural violence is taking place. Uh, to give you an example uh, of uh, the Kamatipura st story, this is a, a unique neighborhood that's kind of located in the heart of the island city of Mumbai, which is seeing a lot of transformation uh, into you know, the tower kind of landscape uh, being made into a world-class city. But this is, a, uh, this is historically an inner city working class neighborhood, which also has the dubious uh, sort of uh, quality or dubious kind of uh, stereotypical image of being the red light area for the city. Uh, where commercial sex work has taken place since uh, the last uh, 200 years. Um, but what this story tries to do is, uh, is try to actually bring about how, uh, how rich and diverse the history of uh, the settlement of the Madhupura is. It tries to break away from the stereotypical image of it being a red light area. Uh, of it being only construed as a place which is immoral, of inhabited by pimps and prostitutes and criminals and drug gangs, but to actually uncover the deep and layered history of the Kamathis, 
and other working uh, laboring migrant groups who came and settled here for the last 200 years. And you can see the GIF, which brings about this kind of fictional uh, putting together the life histories and looking through a building uh, which you know goes through these major transformations uh, uh, as people sort of make uh, claims to this particular story. Um, and then there's another GIF that shows Kamatipura in relief as to how the city itself changes and uh, you know, Kamatipura from being sort of peripheral to the city becomes internal, sort of uh, located in the middle of the city and how it sort of grapples, uh, continues to grapple with the forces of redevelopment. So one of the things it does uh, is highlight the ongoing threat of displacement and disp dispossession of the poor and the working classes from the heart of the city, because they are actually located in the heart of the city, which is, as you can see from the towers and the background that's shaped, being reshaped very, very rapidly. But it's also kind of the last refuge for the working class poor, as you can see from the drums and the, and the clothes hung out there. It's a recycling hub for all kinds of waste right in the middle of the city, along with, of course, being a red light area, continuing to function as a red light area. So it also reveals the kind of tenacity that the working class have shown in constantly negotiating their right to stay put in the middle of the city while there are these other kinds of forces trying to reshape, reclaim the space. Uh, of course, uh, I did not mention the kind of land values that have skyrocketed in this entire place. And therefore, you know, it's, um, it's ripe for redevelopment. And the erasure is not just coming from the state and the market, which is putting up plans for redevelopment, but it is also coming from within the neighborhood where there are uh, settled sort of populations, inhabitants who want the tag of red light area to go. And, and there's sort of this deep kind of contestation that happens within it. Uh, if you move to the peripheries uh, you know, of Nala Sapara is on the northern sort of periphery of uh, Mumbai. And it really talks about the transformations that have taken place uh, and how the peripheries have shaped, uh, have been shaped by the center uh, of the city, but also how, this, uh, how the core of the city uh, can only be seen in relation to the movement of people, the movement of goods, the movement of uh, the displacement of uh, poorer people, working class people off to the peripheries in order to make way for the world class city. Um, you know, there was a time when one of the ministers said, uh, you know, Mumbai wants to be like Shanghai. And that was early 2000, which sort of marked the process of multiple trajectories of displacement that you can see here. The flows, the arrows show the kind of displacements that were uh, triggered, but also uh, how this was kind of uh, helped on by uh, ways in which uh, planning regulations were, uh, were twisted, were uh, sort of uh, worked around with, uh, you know, green areas, areas that were meant to be preserved, uh, were sort of twisted around and made, uh, you know, uh, were settled into by these populations. So illegality, not just, you know, from uh, below, but of course, illegality from within the state and how it kind of interpreted its own plans to suit, suit its own needs. Um, and so what we've done is we've also tried to look at um, how these kind of illegalities were produced, but also how people's histories are being recarved in these new geographies at the periphery, um, how people are trying to sort of reclaim these spaces uh, in and struggling and how a local sort of party is emerging and the politics of migrants are being taken into account in the reshaping of the periphery as well as a, as a counter to the make, remaking of Mumbai. Uh, we have the third and the fourth uh, cases. I'll quickly run through them because of time. Jogeshwari Vikroli Ring Road is the case study of uh, infrastructural violence and of a place named of slums, which were or settlements that were uh, formed years ago that have been named because of a major infrastructural roadway project that seeks to bring together different geographies of the city, but actually lands up completely maiming 
um, you know, a, a, a society, a, a community into, uh, you know, uh, halves across the different uh, parts of the road. And what does this mean for people who live there in these places? And how have their lives been uh, completely decimated by uh, this new infrastructural project, uh, which, you know, there's, there's been tons which has been sent, spent by the government in trying to bring together the eastern and the western coast of Mumbai through this particular road, road project, but it has actually dismembered the community that it runs through. So we've done it through maps, but we've also done it through stories uh, of the people living there. Uh, the fourth and final story is M Ward again uh, of the periphery um, of people who've been dumped through multiple uh, processes of uh, peripheralization of displacement because of infrastructural projects in the remaking of Mumbai and have been dumped into the far eastern sort of uh, uh, space of Mumbai, uh, very next to the dumping ground of the city where they've tried to build a life of their own. And here in this particular city, uh, case study, we sort of uncover the story of the transit maps, but we also try to look at the ways in which uh, in the total lack of state uh, care, uh, of in the total lack of state uh, action, action in terms of giving infrastructure to these people who are trying to carve uh, their homes here, what we find is how people themselves try and make do with makeshift, say, toilets, makeshift arrangements for water, um, and the ways in which they negotiate to do this. So what did this uh, process kind of really reveal for us, and how has this, um, uh, this exhibition sort of helped us, uh, and what this kind of counter mapping, the life stories, etc., tell us? I think it enabled us to reconstruct rec unrecorded histories uh, and the diversity of uh, settlement patterns. It also helped to actually map for the first time the ways in which displacement was happening, much like uh, the previous, uh, you know, the young on stories show, and actually put on space and also show the temporality of some of these movements um, and, and to sort of link these geographies uh, and not see them as disparate, but act to, actually to see them as linked through these projects and through these moments of uh, uh, sort of restructuring. We also have used visual representations like photo stories, photo essays, um, sometimes, you know, uh, life stories, uh, cartoons like you have used, uh, sketches and GIFs to fictionally bring into account some of these uh, sort of stories within the stories. And I think that also has helped us deal with the ethical questions because you cannot put faces and names uh, to some of these people because what they're telling you uh, is, a, is a retelling of what the state has done to them and what the market has brought about to them and these stories have not been told before. So they've named actual sort of uh, people, uh, institutions, etc., which were hard to do unless you had a sort of fictional uh, representation to it. Uh, we've also shown how people have built and attached themselves to places. Uh, so I think this is important. The resistance story is important, not just in simply as protest, not as periodic sort of resistance, but to actually show how attachment grows, how meaningful lives and livelihoods are created, and to show that, you know, Kamatipura also exists and an M ward still exists in the at the same time that you're trying to build a sea link in the midst of Mumbai or your sea time that you're trying to create, uh, you know, uh, images of, uh, you know, something like this at the background. This is actually a pastiche. It's not an actual sort of image, but a, a sort of pastiche of images. But it tells you of the city that's uh, there, uh, of historical moments, but also of resistances and of people trying to carve out lives and livelihoods as as the, uh, as at the same time the state and market recreates uh, the city in a particular way and uh, tries to put a particular meaning to these stories. Um, and to sort of bring about a uh, uh, questioning, of course, of uh, to create a public discourse around, um, uh, so put it out there to put a public discourse, generate some comments. Uh, we've had students using this, we've used this in our class. Uh, we use this in different presentations. It's out there. We've got good feedback. Um, you know, people from the communities have 
uh, seen this and they have reached out to us, uh, sometimes correcting uh, some of the factual errors, but also you know, adding to the layers that is there. Unfortunately, this is, um, there is no, uh, there's no way in which we can sort of, uh, it's a lot kind of thing, you know, it's a one-time site, so we can't sort of improve on this, but maybe there is hope to sort of uh, engage with the work as we go on in future research questions. Thank you. So Thank much. you so much, Vatulia. Eh, brilliant. So we are a bit running out of time. So <laughs> without further ado, then, Ruchika, would you like to share your presentation? Thank you. Uh, thank you, everyone. Um, I will, I'm going to share my screen. I'll try to be brief. Um, so today, uh, what I'm sharing is the work um, of the Missing Basti Collective. And it's a, it's a collective of uh, several, you know, individuals, uh, you know, work, life experiences, decades of, you know, research and work. Um, and uh, and um, I'll, I'll just get into it. I'll start with the context. So the context is, you know, this is this is missing Basti from Delhi. Um, Delhi has seen cycles of evictions and peripheral resettlement uh, of the past few decades, and particularly since the 90s, the, uh, the 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 there has been a largest rise in forced evictions. And um, in the words of Sen and 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 Van, uh, you know, the urban poor have literally been swept off the map. Um, yeah, this is a story that is about a story about the city that is not known enough and it's not told at the scale at which it should be. Um, there are stories of people who have intimately built their lives in the city and they've shaped the city along the way through construction work, domestic work, home based work, um, a multitude of informal livelihoods that make up almost 90% of you know, the country's workforce. Um, and they live in self-built settlements, which are colloquially in Hindi known as bastis, and hence the name Missing Basti. Uh, there are almost uh, 300 documented evictions since the 90s, and of which over 200 evictions were between uh, 1990 and uh, 2020, uh, and, and sorry, 2010, when the Commonwealth Games took place in the city. And the stories of evictions in Delhi is a story of deep inequality, um, you know, dispossession, spatial violence, uh, because forced evictions violate the rights of working families, they erase a lifetime of investment in incrementally built homes, um, debilitating pathways to intergenerational uh, social mobility, um, deepening social inequalities uh, structured and produced through caste, gender, and religious fault lines. Um, so the missing Basti is an archive of these evictions, and um, and invite you all to, at uh, you know, at leisure, go through the site today. I will walk us through it. Um, um, so, uh, so what you can see on the screen here is, you know, a single platform uh, which aims to underscore the scale and severity of such eviction. The aim of the archive is to bear witness uh, to these stories and to make them visible at the scale of the city, in a hope that the act of recording and bearing testament can. Um, can help prevent future evictions and build a right to the city for all. Um, the archive has been built by a collective and it consolidates, as I said earlier, decades of research and life experiences by researchers, communities, housing rights activists, lawyers, filmmakers, and several other practitioners who work closely, um, yeah, who work closely or live, uh, you know, in some of uh, the busties documented here. Um, so if you can see at the landing, the landing page of the site, we have, you know, uh, we have a map of Delhi and conceptually, you know, this was important for us because the scale of the city was important. Um, it was important to acknowledge that these are not isolated one-off events um, and, and to make visible the reality of how the city is self-built and demolished. Um, and also to make visible some of the murky logics of um, evictions. These are opaque and complicated ways um, you know, in which um, evictions get ordered and how they play out over multiple governance agencies which won't speak to one another. So when you click on, um, you know, some of these, you'll, you'll get, you know, you'll see some details about, um, about each of these sites. Um, and, uh, and, and the aim is that when you see, see these together on the, on the map, uh, you know, you're able to um, see the stories together, you're able to see, you know, get a sense of the scale of, of the issue together. Um, and um, 
And so, uh, and so also what you can see from the map is And also from the map, what you can see is um, on each of these, you know, as you click, you will see uh, uh, information about each eviction. Uh, you also see, uh, uh, you know, how the city is dotted with these, you know, red uh, marks of missing busties. And the yellow points are essentially, they are resettlement sites. Um, and you can see, you can notice a spatial pattern where um, the urban poor are essentially getting pushed out to the periphery of the city. Um, there's certain, uh, you know, points where you'd be able to see uh, more stories about uh, each uh, each site. Um, so the other thing, core thing for the archive really was to hold the stories of people. And um, so, as you will see in the feed notes tab, there will be, you know, a range of stories. Um, and some of these are stories of people. Some of these are stories. Uh, you know, uh, of practitioners, some of these are stories that have been told to people who have long, um, you know, relationships with, with, with these sites. Um, and, uh, and some of them will be, you know, for, uh, will be, you know, by uh, lawyers, you know, writing about some of the tensions of, um, you know, of, of working through, uh, you know, the, uh, the tensions of the law and how you know, the Basti is actually, uh, you know, exists. Um, and so in each of these stories, you know, there you will see, um, you will, you know, you will, you will read about, you know, loss, you'll read about lives built before, you'll also read about different governing agencies and the blurriness of evictions, where one agency is responsible for sending or not sending out an eviction notice, and another is responsible for, um, you know, uh, you know, for, for rehabilitation or resettlement. Um, and, you know, there's a different land owning agency and there is a web of governance that is quite opaque. Um, so the last thing I'd like to discuss is, uh, you know, the use of this platform and any use of this platform is inherently um, political. Um, uh, you know, uh, uh, the, you know the, uh, the archive essentially aims to build a counter narrative uh, and contribute to a counter narrative and, 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 and in hopes to be an advocacy tool. So it has a range of resources that uh, that you know are uh, that uh, that are useful. Uh, it has been used for you know a source for media. It has been used. Um, it has been used. Uh, uh, you know, in in different housing reports and policy reports as a reference. It's been used by. It's also been used um, in you know in addition to like the nat the larger narrative of you know the city. It's also been used by. Uh, different, uh, you know, community activists, researchers, architects, planners, and lawyers who work closely with the communities. So, for example, um, I'd like to share, for example, uh, a workshop we did, you know, um, a few months ago uh, uh, with community activists and lawyers. We actually used, uh, you know, um, and this was, uh, uh, you know, uh, a few a few members of the collective were hosting this workshop. Um, uh, through their own institutional capacities, but we used the missing busty you know website and the resources housed on you know know your rights as a tool um, uh, you know as a tool within the workshop uh, to you know while training lawyers and to position you know the history of evictions uh, at the center. Um, and the other thing that the workshop, uh, sorry, the, the website course is, you know, a range of resources, you know, in the form of judgments, reports, and uh, that would be useful for lawyers or researchers, um, you know, while they are engaging with different sites or different, you know, um, or, or different or, 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 you know, situations of evictions. Um, and so finally, I'd like to conclude on how the project has been, you know, a collective project and so um, in one ways this has been you know a methodological approach um, and a way to sort of capture you know the extensive knowledge you know across uh, across people across institutions but there's also it's also been a sort of a political practice as well that is to ensure that no matter how um, you know no matter how slowly or incrementally the you know the this process of archiving is it has taken over three years to launch this, uh, but but it's also a way to ensure that you know the immense data and experience that exists you know over you know a range of people is not restricted behind institutional uh, paywalls or project funding. Um, so while we struggle with you know constantly updating it, we I think we last were able to update a range of evictions that unfortunately 
you know, the reality is that evictions continue and we hope to keep updating them. Uh, you could see some of these, you know, are, are the ones that were done while we were under lockdown. Um, so the aim, the hope for the archive really is to continue this process of, you know, uh, of updating it and archiving. Also as a practice in, in you know, collectively witnessing these stories and, and to, like to hopefully build, you know, so other forms of solidarity through our other forms of practice um, by sharing these ahead. And I will stop here. And um, it's really been, uh, you know, uh, really nice to learn, uh, you know, from, from, you know, the Bombay case and, 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 and from the Yangon Stories Project, because I think we hope to also uh, learn across different uh, initiatives as well. So thank you so much for, uh, you know, calling us here today. Thank you so much, Ruchika. So now we are going to hand over to Professor Hyun to give some comments. Thank you so much. Uh, I understand we have uh, time constraints, so I try to uh, limit myself to not more than five minutes. Um, first of all, many congratulations to the team. Um, and I have to say, this is uh, an amazing project, um, especially carried out on the many constraints of not only pandemic, but also uh, very difficult political situations in case study area. And anyone who has done a study on displacement uh, or uh, violence would understand how difficult this must have been. And I really uh, have my respect for the team to have achieved and you know, what they have done uh, and had presented here today. Um, I also like the, the way the, the various counter mapping practices you know, have been shared, and especially the one from India, as well as the, uh, where the, uh, the, the outcome of uh, the current project team as well. And these, these are really uh, excellent ways of making violence legible and visible uh, and very powerful way. And, and again, anyone who has done such a similar work and you know, would understand how you know, time consuming and difficult it must have been to collect the data and put them into such legible format. I just hope that this uh, will continue to be maintained and updated uh, and so that you know, we can uh, uh, continue to be benefiting uh, from such uh, interventions. I also want to say a um, um, couple of things, actually, actually four points. I'll make it very brief. Uh, four points largely in the context of how um, such spatial violence can be um, not only legible, but also you know, they, they get exercised through illegible ways or illegible modalities. So I acknowledge you know, the current project uh, focus on uh, eviction, uh, fire, arson, or uh, nationalization, which are uh, uh, modalities that you know, the team has identified as legible form and a mod, uh, way, a mode of you know, exercising, experiencing violence. And I fully appreciate you know, such efforts and, and, and acknowledge. Uh, I just want to kind of add, add you know, a couple more thoughts, a few more thoughts, largely in the context of how such you know, violence would also be carried out in a, in a much uh, less visible way. Um, and perhaps this might be something that will allow the project team to further expand in the future um, and also link with other projects which might look at you know, such illegible ways of uh, practicing uh, uh, and enforcing violence. So the first point is, um, I guess, you know, it, uh, um, we need to probably understand also a bit more about how urban space gets constructed um, as for the aspiration of urban elite um, in social, political, and economic spheres. So uh, you know, we get to hear about you know, the exercise of you know, violence you know, uh, imposed upon the marginalized and, and, and the politically weak and, and economically weak and, uh, groups of you know, populations, uh, which are all great. Uh, but I think, I guess, you know, very often we don't really, uh, I, I guess we, we, we actually don't understand very much about how the uh, elites are actually constructing the space as per their own aspiration and how their power is being exercised. And such exercise of power is also you know, a major uh, driver of such violence. And I think we, we probably want to see more. And this is probably where the research has, not only you know, in general, by, by the way, has limitations. And many social science, scientific inquiries uh, uh, have limitation in, limitations in terms of 
kind of infiltrating such network of elites, you know, things that happen beyond the, uh, the curtains and under the table. And this is a long story in urban studies, and, um, including the studies on urban regimes and so on and so forth. The second point is um, um, the emphasis on state actors is legitimate, and this is very you know, uh, meaningful. Uh, and here I just want to add, you know, obviously the, the other dimension is non-state actors and how non-state actors are also very much working with state actors to uh, exercise such violence. And here, I, uh, one uh, particular in a literature that comes to my mind is a recent book published by a political scientist in the University of Toronto, whose name is Lynette Ong, who has published a, a book entitled Outsourcing Repression, Everyday State Powers in Contemporary China. And she basically looks at how in Chinese context, you know, the, the violence has been outsourced you know, by the state to non-state actors, uh, which also makes the violence uh, less visible in terms of association with the state power. And, and when it comes to everyday experience of violence, basically the, the victims or you know, uh, people who are being subject to such violence, we see non-state actors um, who are exercising such violence and therefore the state actors are kind of hiding behind or staying behind uh, such non-state actors and therefore not being accused of, uh, or fingers point, not, uh, you know, not being accused of uh, the actual uh, initiator of such violence. So I think, I guess that's one, one of the examples uh, uh, that would allow us to understand how non-state actors are as important as state actors when it comes to such exercise of violence. Uh, the third point is, again, li uh, linking to the, uh, the capacity of the elite. Uh, I, I welcome the perspective to use displaceability as advocated by and put forth by uh, Oren Eftaker. And I guess in, in this regard, in a, uh, another um, uh, related issue is and how the elites are able to make themselves stay put and avoid in a displaceability. Um, and I think this is where also you know, we need to probably uh, 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 look at the use of particular discourse or hegemonic ideology and, and, and as well as visible force. You know, for uh, such elites you know, to be able to protect themselves and stay put, and also exercise you know, uh, uh, the enclosure of space in order to uh, protect themselves. But at the same time, such enclosure of space will be uh, a major way of you know, ex you know, inflicting violence on, on the poor and the marginalized. The final point here uh, um, I would end my you know, intervention with is, do we have the, the question of you know, uh, what sort of methodology do we have? You know? So uh, I really like the, the counter mapping and, and the ways in which the uh, uh, unintended, unintended archives as well as intended archives being put together and all these are great. And in order to look further and you know, beyond you know, you know, what is more visible forms of violence, I wonder what will be our methodology. I think this is just a question to all of us in a sense. Do we have the enough? Do we have the adequate methodology actually to understand the, the invisible forms of violence being exercised, uh, the the internal working of the network of uh, urban elites, for example? Do we understand how they get exercised? Such network will be, uh, for example, on on the basis of kinship network as well as alumni network. And you always hear about the alumni network being very powerful, uh, and also they get often combined with kinship network as well as the network of you know, people who are from certain regions and, and areas. And all of these are coming together to produce a very powerful network, which is very difficult to identify. You only get to hear about such network once, once you're inside or once you're in a space where they discuss how they are closely related to each other. And, and that's just one example. So I guess the question is, do you have the methodology you know, to understand such an you know, exercise of power by those powerful elites? And, and I, I suppose those will allow us to when they are put together with the findings, with such findings as you know, put forth by the project team, as well as you know, uh, Ruchika and, and Ratula, will allow us to have a full understanding of uh, the forms of state spatial violence and what, they, what that means in, in our contemporary cities. So I stop there. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Yun. I think very, very important points that we need to keep thinking about, and particularly how 
to address the other sides and the invisibility of it, and to what extent researchers themselves are located in the periphery and the marginality of power structures. <laughs> so I think that is a very important point to make. I'm a, a bit conscious of time. We, I think we run over, but there are, I think I found one of the questions already in the chat. So perhaps we have time just to answer and maybe have uh, some reaction uh, from the, the, the presenters to Hune comments. Uh, so maybe can we, I'm gonna just read the question we have on the chat and maybe we can just have a round in terms of reactions to it and trying to connect both the comments and this question if you don't mind. So Jack Hill says, thank you. This was a great, fascinating presentation. I'm curious about the use of legislation versus suspension of laws or rule of law in an action of a spatial violence? Do an actions of a spatial violence need to be legible through law or can we envisage this kind of violence as being lawless, non-legible? And I think that speaks a lot to some of the contents of, um, of the points that Professor Hyun raised. Um, I don't see yet any other question, uh, but maybe we can go around and perhaps have a, a round of reactions uh, answers to the points raised so far. Uh, do you think, can we go with yeah. EC first? Yeah, yeah sure. Um, thanks, Jack, for that question. And I'm sorry, in the like my distraction with the slides, I actually skipped about two lines in the presentation where I was actually addressing this particular issue. So I'm sorry for, for that. Um, and I really wanted to make a note that um, I'm not saying and I'm not trying to say that law is necessary. Um, for the types of violence we've seen that they have to have a legal framework. That's definitely not what I'm trying to say, nor am I trying to say that um, the types of violence we've seen would not happen without these legal frameworks. But I think these frameworks do allow for a certain type of post-violence rationalization by those in power, whether that is uh, military, military actors, whether that is state officials, um, or whether that is urban elites, right? And we need to be cognizant of how law and violence intertwine and how law is used as a rationalizing um, discourse by these actors. So that's kind of the, the thing I wanted to emphasize with looking at these legal frameworks, because I think they endure, right? We, they have uh, trajectories that often started in the colonial period and then later on post-independence, but they are like continuously reutilized um, and reinforced through their usage in urban planning and in um, urban governance. And so I think we do need to take a look at how these have facilitated certain kinds of violence and how um, post-violence or kind of post-eviction, uh, these have been used to justify dispossession, um, justify other forms of, of spatial violence. So I think just the point was more to be quite uh, cognizant of the uses of law and of who is using them and for what purposes and what kind of discursive claims um, about violence and law are being made. Thank you, Isi. Can we move to perhaps Pratula and then Ruchika to make any response or reaction? Uh, yes, thanks to Kieran for you know raising those important points. Um, I think in our case, we tried to sort of attend to some of this through the workings of the stories. Um, for instance, in Kamatipura, we've looked at how actually people, inhabitants, long-term inhabitants of Kamatipura are very much complicit um, in the aspirational uh, ways in which they want Kamatipura to be transformed. And this uh, we've done through um, studying the series of redevelopment projects that have been started and then stalled, started and then stalled at various points. Um, and these are redevelopment projects that have for the neighborhood that have been carved out either by the state or the market. And in the last instance uh, in 2016, by some of the community members, uh, the landlords of Kamatipura itself. So in many ways, these aspirations tell you of, you know, the, the important sort of powerful interests uh, which are there, but also it tells you of the story that you don't get to hear of why they get stalled and uh, who's stalling them and for what reason. So, uh, which adds a lot more complexity to what we've been trying to do uh, through these stories. So I don't think these are, you know, fully fleshed out uh, sort of accounts, uh, but they're ways of telling, um, of privileging certain voices 
over others and we've consciously done that storytelling in that way. Thank you, Ratula. Ruchika? Thank you. Um, I think I'll just build on actually what Ratula just said about, uh, you know, about stories, because I think uh, for Professor Shin, the comment on, you know, the invisible sort of webs of violence, I think storytelling is that space in which, you know, people express the intangible, you know, you know, you know, reasons and, and logics and, and for example, the violence of waiting or the violence of, you know, of anxiety of certain things or, or of caste and, you know, or religion. These, you know, storytelling offers a way to sort of learn about that, um, if not address it immediately. Um, and so I think uh, what we have tried to do in, in, the, uh, in, in the Missing Basti archive and what we continue to try to do is also to use, you know, films and use, use stories as a way to bring in those narratives. Um, and I just also just want to just like, uh, you know, uh, you know, acknowledge like something that I thought was really interesting in both, both you know, uh, uh, other projects. Uh, I think in, um, in, uh, Ritu, uh, in Ritu, uh, the, the thing about the temporality and making si the simultaneity of, you know, the making while the violence is going on, I think that that was a really, really, uh, you know, strong thing. And, uh, and Catalina, I think, um, Catalina, Shoko, is the you know, the gang on team, I think the, uh, the uh, you know, for example, by fire as, you know, as a modality of violence and, and how that plays out, whether it is, you know, uh, intentional or, you know, intentional or accidental or, um, or, or, I mean, in the last month we've had in, in Delhi, we've had, you know, serious heat wave and there's been fires uh, in, in waste picker communities, you know, which is, which is the result of, you know, decades long, neglect and violence as well so how these also play out it, it just reminded me of that as well so yes thank you for yes sharing all of that as well well thank you so much i think it's been a very interesting session in trying to put together this these different projects because we can see the patterns of resemblance as well as the you know, complicated stories of a singularity of, of different places and the different attempts to capture differently these stories. And hopefully in the next uh, presentations, we can be speaking about more hopeful stories of bringing about different spatial imaginations, because I think that is also part of what we can do uh, as researchers and advocates for spatial justice. So thank you so much, everyone. It's been a pleasure to have you. Uh, and thank you for the feedback uh, on, the, on the project. So thank you so much, uh, everyone. And we will be sharing the link uh, of the recording as well in our, in our social media. So thank you so much.